we're now going to run through several different situations and try to define our hy null hypotheses, our alternative hypotheses, choose a statistical test, and think about how we would visualize that difference uh, using plotting. So in the NAMSIS data set, let's say I asked you, is the average age different for men and women? What's our null hypothesis? Our null hypothesis is that the average age is no different for men and women. Because remember, that's the opposite of our actual question here, uh, which assumes or is looking for a difference. And our alternative hypothesis is that the average age is different for men and women. Which tests do we need to answer this question? Now read this question really carefully. And if you read it really carefully, you'll determine that we actually don't even need a statistical test. Because what I asked here is, in the NAMSIS data set, is the average age different for men and women? And since we have the entire NAMSIS data set, we can answer that without a statistical test. However, if I was asking, given the NAMSIS data set, tell me if the average age is different for men and women in the US population, that would definitely require a statistical test because we only have access to a sample, not the entire population's worth of data. So only when you are making inferences about a population do you need to perform a statistical test. So always keep that in mind. Usually we do want to make an inference about a population given a data set. So for this particular question, um, we talked about our null hypothesis, which is that the average age is no different. We're comparing the average age for men and women. So this is a two sample question, um, not a one sample question. So when we talked about two sample tests where one variable is categorical, which is um, in this case, uh, sex, which has two possible options of men and women. And one variable is continuous, which is age. The test that we run is either a t-test or a Wilcoxon test. And that will depend on the distribution of age um, in the data set. So if age is normally distributed, it's a nice bell curve, we can run a t-test. If it's not a nice bell curve, it's not normally distributed, then we have to run a Wilcoxon test because unlike a t-test, a Wilcoxon test makes no assumptions about the underlying distribution of the data. Which plot would we use to actually illustrate this difference? Remember when we learned about the different geoms, that if you had a situation with one categorical variable and one continuous variable, some of the options that were at our disposal were box plots and violin plots. So those would be probably my preferred options here to demonstrate this relationship. So first let's actually uh, do the plot here so that we can figure out which test to run. Had we run the statistical test first, we wouldn't have evaluated our assumption first about the distribution. And so we might've incorrectly chosen to run a t-test. So even though this lecture, I'll often ask you which test to run before I ask you which plot. In practice, you're going to plot your data first before you choose that statistical test. So here, you know, I, like I said, I could have run a box plot or a um, violin plot, but I chose to just make a density plot and then facet it by sex so that I get a separate density plot for women and men. And I didn't have to color in the colors differently, but I chose to set the uh, uh, fill aesthetic to sex. And that way, not only do I facet by sex where I get two different plots, I also fill them in with different colors uh, just to make the differences more obvious. And I set the number of columns in the facet wrap function to one so that uh, they get stacked vertically here. And what you can see looking at this distribution is that this is not normally distributed. For both men and women, there appears to be uh, a peak very early in life and a second peak uh, somewhere in the 50s to 60s. And so, this is, you know, uh, not a normal distribution. 
So based on the knowledge that the data is not normally distributed, we're going to choose a Wilcoxon test. I'm going to show you how to run some of the common tests uh, in the code in the slides here. But realize that on homework, you won't have to actually run the test. You'll have to just tell me which is the right test to run. And you can refer back to this code um, when you're doing your midterm projects to be able to actually figure out uh, how to run some of the common tests. Although I don't think I cover all the tests um, in the slides uh, today. So for a Wilcoxon test, I want to see whether age as a function of sex um, is uh, the same or different. Or put more simply, I'm looking at the different various the different values of age for men versus women. The null hypothesis is that they're no different. And notice that the Wilcoxon rank sum test actually tells me what my alternative hypothesis is, which is that the true location shift is not equal to zero, but it could be in either direction. So this is a two-sided test. Notice that I get a p-value of 0.1589. So how do we interpret this? The null hypothesis is that the average age is the same for men and women. And what this test is telling me is that there is a 16% probability that we would observe this data or something more extreme than what we found by random chance alone. And so that seems relatively unlikely based on the threshold of 5% that is often commonly set in science, we would not be able to reject this hypothesis, reject our null hypothesis. So it is certainly possible that age is no different for men and women, but the chance that it's no different for men and women based on this data set is 16%. And that's what our p-value means. Remember, I also mentioned that each test will also have a test statistic associated with it. And that's that really, really big number that starts with a nine to the left of the p-value. And so you don't have to directly interpret that number in any way, just the p-value that comes to the right of that. So let's visualize this difference. And as I alluded to earlier, you know, violin plots or box plots are two way of doing this. And so in this case, I chose to uh, use a violin plot. And so I mapped X to the, uh, the X aesthetic to sex. I mapped age to the Y aesthetic. So it's just the axes. And then I added a G on violin to get the violin plot. And here's what I get. And so just like our density plot, you know, we were able to see that there's two peaks, uh, in age, one early in life and one towards the fifties or sixties. And in some sense, a violin plot is really just a density plot that's been flipped on its side and made symmetric with its mirror image next to it. So in this case, it looks like a fish, but you know, if it's, if you have kind of a couple different uh, peaks in your data, it can look like a violin. So let's take a look at the and Haynes data set and try to answer this question of whether the weight um, of one-year-old baby girls in the US is different than let's say 21 or is 21 within the realm of possibility for the average weight of a one-year-old baby girl in the US. Here I'm loading in the N. Haynes data set or rather I'm loading in the NHANES package. And the NHANES package actually has two data sets in it. The one we've used in class so far is called NHANES. Um, the one I'm using here is called NHANES raw. And NHANES raw actually has no duplicate individuals in it because it's, uh, you know, is a, is a weighted data set similar to the raw data set that you would download off the CDC website. And so let's check and see if we can find uh, or check this fact about the population in the NHANES data set. So first we take the NHANES raw, we filter in only those individuals 
who are aged uh, 12 months and are w- women uh, or females. And then we calculate the weight in pounds by converting the weight in kilograms to pounds. And we see that the average weight um, or the weight rather for the uh, individuals in this data set runs in the 20s uh, primarily. And if we calculate a summary, the mean weight for women or rather baby girls in this data set who are one one year old is about 21.2 years or uh, 21.2 pounds, sorry. Okay. So based on this, is the mean weight for 12 month old girls 21 pounds in the US population? And for a moment, forget the fact that the data, you know, it does not come from a random sample. Let's assume NHANES raw is a random sample. Which plot would we use here? Since we only have one continuous variable, which is uh, weight in pounds, and we're comparing it against a fixed value, the weight in pounds as a single continuous variable is just going to be either a histogram or a density plot. And that fixed value I'm depicting here as a straight line. Um, and so if we want to draw the histogram, we use geom histogram. And I've specified some bins here because there's such uh, there's so few individuals that the default setting doesn't really work very well. And then I'm also drawing a vertical line here, which is the geom V line. Um, because in some sense I'm testing, is it possible that the mean of the US population is 21 pounds when the distribution of weight in this data set goes all the way from, you know, looks like 18 to 27. So the null hypothesis is that the mean weight of 12 month old girls is 21 pounds. The alternative hypothesis is that it's not 21 pounds. It could be more or less, but it's not 21. This is a one sample test because I'm comparing one variable, one sample, one group against a fixed value. And so which test is the right test for this situation? This is going to be either a one sample t-test or a one sample Wilcoxon test because we've got one sample and that's the data we're comparing against the fixed value is a continuous uh, or quantitative variable. Is age normally distributed? Um, you can't really tell because there's not that many points. So let's just say we don't wanna make any assumptions about distribution um, and if we do, and if we squint, maybe we would say it's actually right skewed because it looks like there's a tail on the right. Although admittedly, this is a small sample set size. And so you couldn't really make that call. So we're again, going to use a Wilcoxon test, except this time it's a one sample Wilcoxon test. And the way we do a one sample Wilcoxon test is we first give it the variable, uh, and the data frame that we, is our data set. We then give it our fixed value that we're comparing against, and we set that value as the mu. And in this case, we got a p-value of 0.92 approximately. And the way we interpret this is that if the null hypothesis is that the average weight for a 12-month-old girl is 21 pounds, there's a 92% probability that the data we see, or something more extreme, would occur just based on random chance alone. And so therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We don't accept the null hypothesis that the 12 month old girls do have a mean weight of 21 pounds. We simply fail to reject it, which I realize is a double negative, but it's an important double negative. And if you accept your null hypothesis based on this test, you're misinterpreting the test. Let's say we said, is the mean weight for a 12 month old girl in the US 25 pounds? And so even though we have a really small sample here, um, assuming that that sample is random, it is highly unlikely that the mean weight for 12 month old girls in the US is 25 pounds 
even just given this very small sample. Because our p-value is like 0 0.0001. And the way, way we interpret that p-value is that there's a less than 1% probability that we would observe this data or something more extreme based on random chance alone, given our null hypothesis. And so therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. Um, and one reason for us rejecting the null hypothesis uh, would be that it is true that uh, the mean weight for 12 month old girls is not 25 pounds, but there's also other factors and biases that could lead to that. And so we can't accept our alternative hypothesis. We can merely reject our null hypothesis. Let's say I wanted to know if sleep duration has changed over time. And the period I'm interested in is the years 2009 and the years 2012. So what is our null hypothesis? Our null hypothesis is that sleep duration has not changed over time, or rather it's unchanged. The alternative hypothesis is that the sleep duration has changed over time. This is a two sample test because we've got data from 2009 and we've got data from 2012. And so, uh, even if these are different individuals, you know, this people who took the survey in 2009 are one sample and the people who took it in 2012 are a second sample. And sure, this depends on how you view time. Is, is time continuous, categorical, or ordinal? But since we're only looking at two time points, let's just consider these to be two categories and we'll treat this as categorical. So here's what the NHANES raw data set looks like. If you group by survey year and look at the first five rows, you'll notice that um, you know the values are missing a bunch of the time and the values that are present are either four hours or eight hours. So has sleep duration changed over time? Can't really tell based on this, but, we've, but we can probably design a test to look at this. So which test would we use? Sleep duration is a quantitative variable. We've got two categories. And so again, this is going to be a t-test versus a Wilcoxon test. And we need to look at the distribution. If it's normally distributed, we run a t-test. If it's not, we run a Wilcoxon test. OK. So how about this question? Does the number of kids you have affect how much you sleep? The null hypothesis is that the number of kids you have does not affect how much you sleep. The alternative hypothesis is that it does affect how much you sleep. And we consider this two different variables. The number of kids is kind of one variable and the number of um, the hours of sleep is another variable. And so typically this is not, you know, a one sample situation, but this is a two or more sample situation. Notice that number of kids is a quantitative value and number of hours you sleep is a quantitative value. They're not technically continuous because you can't have one and a half kids. Um, but let's just assume that, you know, um, that these are both continuous values, even though they're not. And if you have two continuous variables that you're comparing, remember that you're going to do either a Pearson test or a Spearman test. And the type of test you choose depends on whether your data are normally distributed. So are both the variables normally distributed is something that we need to ask. Let's actually take a look at the distribution for both variables. Um, we selected number of babies and number of hours per night. We gather those up so that we created a column for number of variable, uh, number of babies and number of hours per night. Um, and then we plot this and we show a histogram and we facet it by the two variables. If this ggplot code looks confusing, feel free to run these kind of one line at a time to see how we got to this plot. But you'll notice that it looks like the number of babies is right skewed because the peak is on the left and there are a number of trailing observations on the right. Sleep hours per night looks like it certainly could be normally distributed, 
it does look like it's slightly asymmetric, but that could just be related to the size of the bins. So given that number of babies was not normally distributed, we chose to run a Spearman test here as opposed to a Pearson test. And both the Pearson and Spearman test are run using the core.test function where you're testing a correlation. And then you have to tell it the method that you wanna use. And the default method is a Pearson. And so if you don't wanna use the Pearson correlation method, you have to specify a method of Spearman. We get a value for rho, which tells us the strength of the correlation or the slope of the correlation. Um, and that's you know, specific to this test. So we're not gonna look at it for the purposes of this class. And we notice the p-value is 0.31. So how do we interpret this? And if we were to plot this, how would we plot this? I won't go through the interpretation of this p-value of 0.31 because we've already gone through a number of p-value interpretations. But take a look and see if you can come up with the correct interpretation of the p-value. Since both of these are continuous uh, variables, if we wanted to plot this, we would use a scatter plot. And a scatter plot, we would generate using this code in ggplot. And that would produce for us this relationship between the number of babies on the x-axis and the number of sleep hours per night on the y-axis. What do we notice here? Notice first that there's only a handful of points here. Um, even though we know our data set has a lot more people than this. And the inclination you probably get is that because the points are so evenly spread out, probably there's been rounding that's occurred here. And so the number of babies we know can only be a whole number, but number of sleep hours per night could have been a fraction, you know, it could have been 12.2 hours per night. But in fact, in this data set, it appears that the data has been rounded. So um, how do we bring out those differences in the, in the points here? Uh, despite the fact that there's a ton of overlap. And one of the ways we can do that is to jitter those points. So what's going on here is that there's overplotting that's happening. And we're going to fix that by replacing the geom point with the geom jitter. And I'm also going to add a smooth line here just to help with visualizing the relationship, uh, which can also be helpful when uh, there's a lot of points being plotted and you can't make out the overall relationship. Now you'll notice something very different, which is that there are a ton of points and you can see where the density of points is highest and where it's lowest. And I bet if you look back at this last plot, this plot looks basically unrecognizable. Uh, you basically cannot tell this is the same data that's being plotted here, even though it is, because the jittering of the points brought out differences that you know weren't even imaginable on that last plot. And when we look at the smooth line, we actually just see that it looks like for the most part, this is just, you know, um, a flat relationship uh, here. And um, so I don't make anything really of that smooth line. And even looking at this correlation, I mean, I, maybe there's a slight positive correlation, you know, on the, especially on the right side of this um, plot. But, you know, I think the, the findings of this plot, which don't show me a clear linear relationship between these uh, two variables, matches up with that p-value we got of 0.31, which was not statistically significant. So let's say we wanted to see whether different regions in the US have a different breakdown of race. And so I produced this little table here um, showing the you know, two by two contingency table between region and race. What test do we run to figure out if the distribution of race is different across the different regions? So is racial breakdown different in each region of the country? The null hypothesis is that the racial breakdown is not different in each region of the country. The alternative hypothesis is that they are different. Um, the breakdown is different in each region of the country. And since we've got two categorical variables with uh, you know, two or more categories, we're going to use a chi-square test to test this relationship. 
Notice that even though the question I asked was, is the racial breakdown different in each region of the country? I could have also asked, is the region breakdown different for each person of each race in this country? And from a statistical testing perspective, those questions are effectively identical here. So I would have gotten the same p-value uh, regardless of how I, you know, if I re re reverse the order of patients dollar sign race and patients dollar sign region. And I get a p-value here that is quite low. Um, e stands for 10 to the, uh, 10 to the power. So this is a p-value of less than, uh, you know, two times two time, or sorry, 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16th, which is suggesting that, that, you know, um, it's highly unlikely that the relational breakdown is not different given the observed data. So we can say that you know, it's highly unlikely. And if we were going to plot this, remember what I said about when you have two categorical variables, even though the visualizing data cheat sheet doesn't have this as an option, my preferred way of plotting two categorical variables especially when I'm comparing proportions, is a stacked bar chart. And the specific type of stacked bar chart I really like for the situation is the bar chart where the position is set to fill. And that way, we're able to look at the actual changes in the proportions. So one thing that immediately stands out here is that there are very large you know, uh, pinkish bars and red bars. And those red bars actually have missing values in them. But for some reason in, in the original NAMSA's data, in the patient's data frame, the missing values weren't specified as NAs. They were specified as quotes so that we actually have to manually remove them to plot this. Had they been classified as NAs, I'm not sure if they actually would have shown up here. But uh, when I looked closely at the missing values, they actually were classified as uh, empty quotes. So to get rid of the missing values, um, especially because in the West, I mean, almost half the data on race is missing, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, we can mutate the patient's data frame to get rid of these missing values. So I filtered out, uh, so I could have mutated them to make them missing, but I chose to filter out the values where race is missing and to generate the same plot. And now I can see that the, there are differences and you know the biggest difference that I see is that one, it looks like by and large there are more, uh, you know, higher percentage of uh, blacks in the south as compared to any of the other regions. And similarly, there are a much higher proportion of Asians in the west as compared to any of the other regions. And so that chi-square test didn't give us this level of interpretation that the plot gives us. It just told us the null hypothesis was highly unlikely, but it gave us no inkling as to why. So this is why you know it's important to plot your data before you run a statistical test. Even if you find something significant, it's worth plotting your data afterwards to try to get a sense of why the test found a statistically significant difference and whether that difference is actually meaningful uh, on the page. There are times where you'll get very, very minor differences on a plot that are statistically significant. And the takeaway from that is that those differences may not be meaningful, even though they're statistically significant. Okay. So if I were to ask you, based on the US census data, are there more women than men in the US? Which statistical test would you use? What would be your null hypothesis? What would be your alternative hypothesis? So in terms of which test, remember that if you have the data for everyone who filled out the census survey, um, and that is also the same people that you wanna make a conclusion about, you potentially don't even need a test. You can just ask your question on the raw census data. So if you believe the census data to be complete, then the data draw, is drawn from the entire population and there is no need for a test. But if it's not complete, the test that you're going to run is the chi-squared test. Um, and this is a uh, 
test where you're assuming your null hypothesis is that there are no differences in the num in the proportion of men and women. And so what you're really doing is, in some sense, you're comparing the ratio of men to women against a fixed ratio of 50%. And the null hypothesis is that the ratio is 50%. And the alternative hypothesis is that the ratio is not 50%. You didn't have to say that the null hypothesis was that they were equal. You could have set a null hypothesis of 70% women, 30% men, and then tested alternative hypotheses that are different from that fixed proportion that you're testing against.